Thank you, Mark. Good job for uh, pinch hitting. That was good. Um, it's a little different being out here on the patio, but you know, we're here and um, I'm thankful that we have a place. So they, uh, uh -oh. this uh, podium doesn't like the Bible. The table notes are, should already, who does not have table notes? Okay, we need some table notes back in the back here. We have been, uh, so just to give you an idea, so um, the, the forum has said that they're doing, a, uh, first of all, there's like a wedding in our main room, that's why we're not there. But they said, hey, you guys can use the patio. And I'm like, well, we'll, we'll take the patio because I, I didn't want to miss two weeks in a row because uh, typically we're off this weekend with the Memorial Day holiday. But with us being off next weekend, because we can't use the patio and we can't use the room, I was like, well, then we're gonna meet, we're gonna meet Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so that's why we're out here. But uh, in talking with some of the people at the forum, uh, they're gonna redo this whole area of the patio. So they're gonna make it more conducive to gatherings. I mean. The, the, the stage over there is for a band, and I think they want a larger area for people to enjoy a band. So I'm thinking, hey, it would be cool during the winter months if if this is conducive to uh, open seating and we can not be all behind the orange tree like these guys are over here. Um, part of me thought of going up top and teaching like the Pope does and just look up over you like this, being up top. But so. Eventually, uh, we'll probably see over the next couple of months this area being all uh, uh, remodeled. And I don't know, maybe if, if we want to during the winter months, we can be outside and, and have practice out here. But we're here. I thank you guys for getting up early and coming. Thank you guys on Zoom. I don't know how many we have on Zoom, but um, it's Zoom is uh, a blessing, even though the audio sometimes is poor and, and whatnot. If you haven't had a chance to get coffee or donuts, uh, we do have those. I would just say, hey, just walk behind the stage here. There's a little alleyway and get to the coffee and donuts over there. But let's let's jump let's jump into our lesson, guys. We've been in First Peter for how many weeks now? Probably five, six weeks now. So open your app or your your tablet or your Bible to First Peter, and we're gonna we're gonna jump in. Um, Peter has given us instructions, men. Peter has given us instructions on how to. How to live, how to live a godly life, how to deal with oppression, how to deal with government. How did last week was how to deal with your wife? How, how do we how do we address uh, how do we love her correctly? Um, Peter has talked about how to lay things aside in chapter two. He's, he's saying, man, if, if if malice and hate and deceit is is part of your life here's how you lay it aside here's how you stop doing that here's how you change and so it's this is like the answers to the test you know all you guys cheated in high school i know you did you know why because i did too <laughs> just kidding okay let me rephrase that some of you cheated in high school and the reason why i say that is because i did too so no i mean when you have a cheat sheet right you have a cheat sheet like we did in high school. When, when we have the answers to the tests, that's a good thing. This Bible, this book, this is what we do. This is the answers to the test, men. This is why we come and practice week in and week out is, I don't know about you, but I need the answers to the tests. And, and out in this world, in this culture, in our marriage and our kids and life and living, it's a test. It's hard. <laughs> And Peter gives us answers. Jesus Christ gives us answers to the test. Paul gives us answers to the test. David and Moses, this is the answer to the test. And so that's why we come here and we, and, and we practice. So there was a pastor who was building a shed in his backyard. And the neighbor boy was looking through the lattice at his neighbor, who's a pastor, build this shed. And the pastor, as he was building the shed, looked over at the boy through the lattice and says, hey, do you want to come over and help? Do you want me to show you some, some tricks, some, some tools, some ideas how to build a shed? And the neighbor boy was like, no, 
The next day, same thing. He starts, he's out there building this shed in his backyard, looks through the lattice, little boys like looking at him. And the pastor's like, you sure you don't want to come over? Like, why are you staring at me? Like, you're just sitting there watching me. This is what the little boy said. I'm watching you to see how you respond when you hit your thumb with the hammer. <laughs> see, we're being watched, men. We're being watched by our, our, our spouses. We're being watched by our children. We're being watched by coworkers. We're being watched, especially if you, you call yourself a Christian and, and, and people know you're a Christian, you're being watched. And, and so it's like, okay, how, how do we do this? And that's why, again, Peter gives us answers to the test because, you know, this, the title of the lesson, as you see, it's, it's Godly Living Part 2 because Part 1 was last week. This whole thing has been godly living, but as you see in your notes there, I put, it's a lifetime of training and practicing, right? It's a lifetime. This is not something that we eventually get down. We, we don't eventually just all of a sudden, okay, now I get it. Now I got it all. I'm good. I, I actually don't need to go to church anymore or men's group because I got it down. No, that, that, that never happens. It is a constant grind, a constant growing of pursuing the Lord and it's a lifetime of, of training. You know, I'll tell you guys often, it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. When, when you say yes to Jesus and say, okay, you will be Lord of my life. I'm going to follow you. I want to be Jesus Jr. I want to do this. I want to do what your word says. Hardest thing you'll ever do. But it's also the biggest blessing you'll ever receive. Because blessings, men, are on the other side of obedience. Blessings are on the other side of obedience. And so we're, we all have an obedience problem. We, we, we struggle with obedience because while we have the answers to the test, right? We don't take those answers and we don't apply them. And again, that's why we practice. That's why we're here week in and week out. It's like, okay, how do we do this? Let, let's come together. It's, let's come together. See, the world out here, men, their hope is in their career the title on their business card, right? Their children, their income, what else? Their retirement, their their new Corvette, right? Well, I've got a new Corvette, but, <laughs> but I'm not saying that your hope is in your Corvette. But you, you guys see where I'm going, right? The world, it's in sex, it's in money, it's in power. And especially for men, it's definitely in sex and money and power. We, we want all that. And, and, and then once we have some of that, we want more of that. And, and what is all that stuff that the world wants and has? It's, it's, it's a mirage, right? It's, 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 it's empty. It's empty. And I know, I, I just looking at the, the group of guys here and some of the guys on Zoom, uh, just knowing some of your stories, there's guys in, in our group here that they've had tons of money and power and sex and fame, and they, they've had that. And they've told me, and I'm sure they've told you at your table, it's a mirage. It's empty. But God's word is not. And those three verses I have in your notes, Acts 14, 22, it's talking about hardships. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The, the famous one is John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. And Jesus says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And then 2 Timothy 3, 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. So when, when there's a little boy watching a pastor, right, build a shed, and he's just sitting there waiting for him to smash his thumb to see how is this pastor going to respond, how does the world respond to Christians? How, how does the world respond to, Christ, to Christians? How about this? How does the world respond to people that do good? Okay, because the answer, most of the time, I mean, the, the world responds very, very well to people that do good. It's when they find out why you're doing good, if it has to do with Jesus Christ, then that's when things get a little blurry, right? Because anytime somebody does good, if we see it on the news, helping out the community, and you know, I, I hate the saying, walking an old lady across the street, you know why? Because none of you have walked an old lady across the street, because I haven't. It's, okay, Steve Phipps, okay, we got one. Okay, Mark, okay, Tio. Okay, so we have a couple of guys. You, so you, seriously, there was an old lady standing there. No, not, your grandma doesn't count. 
people. No, no, she's graduated. I was thinking of my wife. <laughs> Glenn just said I was thinking of my wife. <laughs> These are being recorded, Glenn, and I said your name. Guys, his last name is Orzano. Glenn just walked to the old lady across the street, and it was his wife. That's what Glenn said. Okay. All right, bad analogy. When the world sees that people do good or right, they're fine with that. But when they find out you're doing right and you're doing good, all because of our example of Jesus Christ, that's when things get blurry. And, and that's when things get a little different, when trouble begins. And so today, we're, we're talking about trouble as far as doing good in a world that's watching us, like that little boy watching the, the pastor. And, and, and so Peter here is, again, as, as I mentioned in my opening, he's talking about how to deal with difficult times when, when Christians are being scrutinized, when, when we as men are being looked upon like, and again, when I say the world, this could be people in your family, right? People that, who have known your past and they're just like, yeah, whatever, he's doing good. But man, do you remember him back in 82? You remember what this cat was like? And so the scrutiny and the, 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 um, just the, the people reflecting and remembering who you were pre-Jesus. And it, it, it's a grind, and it's a it's it's a uh, something we, we got to continue to work on. And so, so do you, you see in your notes, we're in First Peter chapter three, and let me read verses thirteen through sixteen. 1 Peter three verses thirteen through sixteen. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what you do good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give you an account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence, verse 16, and keep a good conscience so that the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ, will be put to shame. So there's our couple of verses we're going to unpack, and I'm going to go through through this. But I'll tell you what, man, as I studied this verse this week, when I came to verse 13, again, you got to remember the context, man. Peter is talking to the Gentiles who, who aren't Jews. Okay, so Jesus has already come and died and risen and left, and now the disciples are, are doing ministry. And the, and the Gentiles have this inferiority complex, right? They're, they're not happy because they're not Jewish, and they're thinking, well, that's the Jewish Messiah, and he, is, he did all these miracles, but, but we're not Jewish, and Peter is saying, you're welcome into the kingdom of God. You don't, don't have this inferiority complex. So again, the Roman government was, was uh, hampering and causing all kinds of problems with the Gentiles. So that's who Peter's writing to. He's writing to Gentiles. A Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew. I'm not Jewish, so I'm a Gentile. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. So Peter is basically saying, yes, the, while the Roman government is, is persecuting us and we're, we're homeless, verse 13 says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? I'm sure some of your versions have it different. But man, if I read this verse, guys, just being real with you, and, and Peter's telling me this, who was there to harm you? I'd be like, Einstein, Hello, Peter, the, the Roman government has killed my uncle and my aunt and some of my cousins or some of my children. Hello, Peter. What are you talking about? Who is there to harm us? It's the Roman government. Wake up, Einstein. It's the Roman government. But I'll cut Peter some slack because he's just telling, he's just reminding us. He's, he's basically reminding us, guys, persevere. So guys, when it's your family banging on you, for being a Jesus follower, because they know your past, right? Persevere, hang in there. Come, come here to practice. Go to church, get in small group to where you're around others that can encourage you, because that's all Peter's doing right here. And, and if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, and we've broken down First Peter 1, 2, now we're in 3, what is it? It's constant encouragement. It's constant, guys, keep going. It's okay. It's going to suck. It's going to be hard in this world. There's going to be troubles. If you talk a certain way, stop. Reflect Jesus. Be Jesus Jr. 
When your people bang on you for following Jesus, hang in there, persevere. That's what Peter's talking about here. So we have a living hope. If you recall, verse one, Peter says, what's our hope in? Is it in money, sex, power, fame, women, the title on your business card? Is that where your hope is? Peter says, no, our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is when we graduate and when we exit this earth and we're in the presence of him. He keeps talking about an inheritance. If you remember in, in chapter one, he says, we have an inheritance. And we all understand what that is right away. When we think of inheritance, we go right to money, right? I mean, that's normal. I'm not banging on you. That's what I do. That's an inheritance, we, what are we going to get? What do we get? So from a worldly standpoint, we understand inheritance. We know what we're going to get. Spiritual standpoint, what are we going to get? If you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you've surrendered to him, and he is your Lord and Savior, and you're on mission for him and you're following him, our inheritance is being with him. It's being with him. It's being in heaven. It's graduating and leaving this hell hole, as I say, and we go to heaven. That's our inheritance. So that needs to be our focus. And that's where Peter's going verses, uh, in these verses 13 through 16. Let's break this down a little more. You know, I don't have a watch, so I don't know what time it is. How am I doing? 7.30. Oh, we got plenty of time. We did announcements. 7.30, man, you, you did good. You glitched right through it. We may leave a little early because my brothers over here in the sun are like, okay, I'm, it's, it's blitzing down on me. All right, verse 15, Peter says, be ready to make a defense. Be ready to make a defense. So in my notes here, I put, men, we have a responsibility to know what we believe and to be able to talk about it. Okay, so this is where it gets hard. This is where it's, so do you know what you believe? Because we have our Mormon friends that are in our neighborhood that we love, but they believe something just a little bit different than what we believe. But ultimately, that little bit difference that we believe turns into a big difference in what we believe. So do you know what you believe as it pertains to your life following Jesus Christ? This is, again, why we practice, why athletes practice, because they get in a rhythm, they get in a routine, and they get good habits in and bad habits or bad fundamentals out, right? That's why athletes are always training. And we'll call it practice because we're coming here to train. Week in and week out, we're going through this book. No matter if I'm up here teaching or, or someone else, we're diving in this book, talking about the Bible. And so that's why I push you guys. Guys, Monday through Friday or whatever, Sunday through Saturday, Sunday. Guys, study this book. Take, these, take this series that we're doing in First Peter and do it on your own. Let's go. I'm your coach. You know, I'm your head coach or whatever. I'm going to push my athletes. I'm going to push you. You guys got to work on your own. We all hated homework, right? But this is homework. Apply what you're learning to your life, men. Don't just take it in and do nothing with it. Take it in and then act it out. Take it in and act it out. Be ready to make a defense. What is your ministry? The answer is your ministry is your home. Your ministry is your wife, your kids. Your ministry is your workplace to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, don't just keep all this in. And here's what happens because it happened to me and I'm sure it's happened to many guys. You're embarrassed, you don't know, and you're, you're I would say ashamed, but maybe there is a shame. I know when I was in junior high and high school, I didn't want anybody to know I was a Christian because I was still, I was trying to find myself, right? And I'm sure you, you have young men or you remember your, your kids were 12, 13, right? They're, they're trying to find themselves. They're trying to figure out where they fit in this world. So everything is like embarrassing or overdramatic, right? Okay, well, we're, we're grown men. And, and, and again, I'm going to push you. You call yourself a Christian, act like it, start making changes. As Peter said, when, when, when malice and rage and envy and all that stuff starts bubbling to the top, what does Peter say? He says, set it aside. If you want to take notes, where was that? That was in uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. If you're taking notes, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. And if you struggle with malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, Peter says, put it aside. This is our playbook. This is what he says right here. Put it aside, man. All right, let's keep going. All right, so your ministry. Man, it's at home. 
it, it's at your workplace. Um, so, so how do we do this? And, and this is where Peter breaks it down in verses 15 and 16. He says, may our Christian faith be shown with gentleness and respect and reverence and to have a good conscience. Okay. So, so when you're at your family gathering, which may be on Monday, right? If you get together with family or whatever, if you're getting with family and, and, uh, stuff is giggled about that's not right or stuff is talked about that's not right or instead of having one or two beers you you you're thinking of having eight or nine and getting all s-faced that's when you show responsibility right that's when you act different that's when you be different and you just say you know what i'm not going to talk about that or this anymore i'm not going to giggle about this or that anymore and i'm not going to get all messed up uh, why because i'm i'm different now, you don't need to wave that flag as I'm different. That's the last thing you want to do. But you need to have, a, you need to act on it and be different. And so if you're asked about, hey, why did you remove yourself from that conversation? Hey, how come you're not, how come you're not drinking? How, how come? That is your opportunity, man. That's your opportunity to proclaim. And that's what this whole thing is talking about is how are you going to respond? How are you going to respond? Like the little boy was waiting to see how the pastor was going to respond when things didn't go well. How are you going to respond to family, to friends, to defend the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, to speak truth about the gospel? So 15 and 16, there's the, I talk about the answers to the test. 15 and 16 is talking about here's, here's the answer to the test. You do it with gentleness. You do it with kindness. Don't be an a-hole to your family or friends. And I mean, who wants to be around that? Just, just be yourself, man, but be different. But be different. May it be done with gentleness, respectfulness, be polite, kind, truthful in a Christ-like manner so that the gracious gospel of God is not contradicted by the ungraciousness of people. Because people are ungracious, right? You have people in your family when you're around people in your family, right? They're ungracious. They're, they're wicked. They're wanting to point out all your faults. They're wanting to say, man, I remember what you were like in the 90s. I remember what you were like just last year. And now you're this Jesus follower. Respond gently, bite your tongue, okay? Because this is real, right? This stuff happens. And, and as practice, as men, we come together and say, okay, how do we, when we depart here and leave this facility, how do we do this? And there's the answer right there. Peter says, do this politely, respectful, be prepared, um, know what you believe, be able to give a defense for your faith. Uh, don't be like a 13 year old boy and say, I don't know. I'm just trying to be a better man. No, there's your opportunity. When, when someone says, why are you acting this way? I, I see that you're, you're different. Like what's going on with you? That is your opportunity, man, to share the gospel. That's your opportunity to, to, to share what, what God has done. Yes. Go ahead, Ralph. I'll repeat it. So make it concise so the guys on Zoom can hear. So, you know, I'm a practical guy. What, what would you say? Give me an example of what someone's saying to you. So I'm at, I'm at a, a BQ. And You're at a barbecue. Somebody's throwing a throwing beer. And Ralph, back in the day, he used to do that. Yep. Okay, so Ralph's like, you're at a party. People are throwing down beers. And people see that Ralph is not throwing down beers. And someone comes to you and says, Ralph, what's up? You've only had one or two. And I remember old Ralph. That's a great question. How would you guys respond? New man Ralph. New man Ralph. It's gentle. You don't, you don't get behind a microphone and say, okay, guys, here's why I haven't had nine beers today. <laughs> Whoever asked you that, you gently, calmly, politely pull them aside. Or if you're in a group and someone says, yeah, Ralph, and there's three or four of you, say, man, I'm a different dude because I have made some changes in my life. And the changes in my life is I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. See, that is where you're going to want to say, well, I'm just trying to be a better husband. I'm trying to be a better citizen. I'm just trying to be a better dude. And the whole time the Holy Spirit says, point it back to me, Ralph. Point it back to me. Here's why, Ralph. This is in my notes. It's later on. Jesus Christ hung naked on a cross for you, Ralph, for you, Jim, for you, Pablo, 
naked. His beard was ripped out for you and for me. And here we are at a party. And I love that question. Thank you. We're, we're at a gathering. I get goosebumps just thinking about this. Because guys, think, just think about what Jesus did for us. Yes, it was 2,000 years ago. But he was humiliated for you and for me. And he was saving us. And here we are at a party and we're embarrassed. We're just like, yeah, I'm just going to tell him I'm just trying to be a better dude. And then that's it. Guys, our instruction is to be gentle and kind and courteous. But guys, give the credit to Jesus Christ and what he's done in your life. So think about what Jesus did. That's, that's what I want you to leave here today with. He was mocked and ridiculed. He was spit on while the Roman soldiers were giggling at our Savior on the cross. And if that doesn't move you, if you're not, if you're bored with Christianity, something is wrong. Peter's telling us this is how you respond when you're at a party and the beer is flowing and the drugs are happening and the, the women and whatever. That's going on, and you're there. You slowly remove yourself. Or when someone asks you, have some balls, guys. I can say that because we're men, and this is what we do at practice. Take a step. Take, that's what Peter's saying is, is have a defense of why are you different? Take that step of faith and tell them it's because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And what do we say here at practice? We don't like I don't like saying it. I don't like saying I'm a believer, right? Why? Because the, the, the demons say they are believers in James. Again, we're followers of Jesus Christ because the demons don't follow. Okay, of course we have to believe. I said this a couple weeks ago. Don't get all hung up on, hey, honey, Bobby said we don't believe. We believe, but guys, we follow. We follow. We follow. And we follow this book. The demons don't follow, and the world doesn't follow. There are people that call themselves Christians. And I'm just going to, I may step on some toes. They call themselves Christians, but they're not following Jesus. And so I would have to say, listen, I don't know you. I don't need to know you. You know why? Because I know the book. I know the book. So I don't have to know you and know all the intricacies of you. But if you call yourself a Christian and you don't proclaim him when you're being pressed at a party, are you truly a Christian? I know some of you are going to have problems with that, but I'm just going to say, are you truly a Christ follower if you don't proclaim him when it's tough? Okay, Because it's easy to proclaim Christ on the beach with a fat bank account and everything's going well. And I love Jesus, right? But when it hits the fan, when you when all of a sudden Parkinson's is kicking your butt, when, when, when work and I, some of my friends here are unemployed, when you're unemployed, when your children and your wife are saying, yeah, I have no problem with abortion. Yeah, I have no pride. A buddy of mine say that this week, and he was pissed. He was like, I guess I have no impact in my family. My, my children and my wife, they're, they're all fine with just this, that, and the other. And it's like, hang in there. Keep going. I totally got off my notes. Thanks, Ralph. Bobby, one more thing. Yes. Because of that choice I made, I have more peace and joy in every circumstance of my life than I know. So James is saying, because I've made that choice to follow Jesus, because I have, I have proclaimed that, I now have peace. And where does that peace come from? Who does it come from? It comes from God. So, yeah, so now we, and once you dip your toe into that water and, and, and you're in a setting where there's all, 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 just that setting. I don't need to explain it. You know what I'm talking about. Once you dip your toe into that water, the next time that situation happens, you, you, you now, your foot is in the water and now you're up to your calves and your ankles and your thighs and your right, right now it's, it becomes a little easier and easier. Why? Because you're, you're starting to be bold and who is helping us? The helper with capital at capital H, the Holy spirit Because in John 15. That's when Jesus says, I will bring you the helper. Once you accept me into your life, that is the Holy spirit's job. Many times guys, I'll have you or, or guys in practice come up to me and they'll just unload on me and just say, Bobby, you don't understand what's going on in my life. My wife, my this, my addiction, my da-da-da-da-da. 
And I'm sitting there listening to you. And while I'm looking you in the eye, I am praying. And I'm saying, God, help me. God, help me. I don't know how to respond. I don't know. I can't relate to this guy. I don't know. I've never done cocaine. I, I, you know what I mean? I'm just like, God, help me. Help me. And then finally, when you come up for air, now it's time for me. All of a sudden, things are coming out of me that I'm like, okay, I, I don't know where that came from. But that, that's just coming out. And the and the the recipient is like, dang, that was amazing. Thank you, thank you. And I'm just like, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and and what is that? That's the Holy Spirit working in me and in you to help you when you're in this circumstances. In in what we're talking about, verses 13 through 16. This is what I'm saying, guys. Take this home and study it, and then apply it. And here's what's going to happen, man, because this is how the Holy Spirit works. You're taking all this in right now, right? Yeah, exactly. So you don't feel it. It's going to come up today, maybe by 11 o'clock. Maybe while you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and you're ready to show your tall finger, right? Maybe with your wife, maybe at a party, whatever. What happens is when you're in and you say, you know what? I am. I'm in. I'm not that good at this, but I'm in. He is my savior. I'm going to follow him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue him. I, I, I'm all in. And then the Holy Spirit's going to say, okay. And then all of a sudden, here comes a test. And guys, just let's just be honest, right? We, we fail tests often. I fail tests often. But I'm passing tests. Hopefully, you are starting to pass tests. And even though if you're new to Jesus and you're, 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 you're kind of in your infancy stages of following Jesus, you're going to fail, but you're also going to pass. I texted a guy this week. And he was telling me, and I made, my reply was baby steps towards Jesus. It's baby steps towards Jesus, man. See, some of you guys want, you. yes, we have the answers to the book, but you like want to take the test and pass it with flying colors. It's not going to happen. Why? Because we're fallen. Because our flesh is pulling us this way to check her out, to drink, to undress her with your eyes, to flirt with her, to say stuff you shouldn't say. And then the spirit is saying, don't undress her with your eyes. Only have one beer or or no beers. Uh, leave that. The, leave those friends. Leave this environment. So it's that war. It's that war of good and bad. It's that. It's that. And the Holy Spirit saying, "Come on, no, we've we've practiced this. Now it's game time. Now it's game time." Yeah, the bathrooms are through there if you need them. So it's game time. If you if you need to, uh, you know, just have that reminder of the good versus bad. That's why we're here. We're here to practice. And we only do it for 90 minutes a weekend, right? So I don't know, what's the number of minutes a week minus 90? Some of you guys probably know that. But that is game time. That is game time. Someone's figuring that out now, right? So, thinking, <laughs> so there's some smart dudes in this room. They're like, I'll figure out how many minutes that is. So we meet for 90 minutes. And then whatever small group you have or devotion you have or church you go to, whatever. We come and, and, and we break this down. Okay, now I'm really off track. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm right on track. <laughs> okay, so in your notes, here's four ways to become an effective man in serving the Lord. Okay, they're pretty basic because I'm a basic dude. I, I, I'm basic, but everyone testifies. Number one, everyone testifies. Verse 15 talks about that. Honor Christ as Lord in our hearts. We, we need to testify. I, I've talked about that. There will be an opportunity. Are we short on some pins? We good? Everyone needs to testify. Everyone, meaning every dude in this room right here, every dude on Zoom, you need to testify. Okay? So I put my notes here. Every Christian that names Jesus as Lord must tell others about Jesus Christ in your life. And I put my note in your notes there, too. I say, don't be speechless. And it's going to happen. I know some of you guys are thinking, you're like, oh, crap. It's going to happen. It's going to happen today, tomorrow. It's going to happen. And here's the thing, guys. It's going to continue to happen. It's not like there's an end to this. There's gonna, we're going to be old men. We're going to be on our deathbed. We're going to be about ready to graduate. And that's when it ends. Okay? But I'm just looking around. Well, some of the guys may not have much longer here, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have a long way to go, guys. We have a long way to go. So don't be speechless. Number one, everyone testifies. Number two, hold on, before I get to number two, there, here's, and I talked about this a little bit. I put here in my notes, scared feelings and scared thoughts. 
And I already talked about this and I, I told you what I do. I sit there and I start praying. And in my notes, I've put men pray at every moment when these feelings arise, when you're at that party and someone says, hey, what's up with you? Because that's typically how it goes. They're not going to come up and say, hey, you follow Jesus. What's up with you? They're going to say, Mark, what's going on, man? What, what's up with you? And you know what they're talking about. They're just like, yeah, you seem different. Like, are you on medication? Are you like, what are you doing? Are you doing yoga? What, what are you doing? And that's your opportunity. So when that moment comes, guys, pray. Pray, pray, even if it's your wife, even if it's your adult child asking you some hard questions, pray, bring the Holy Spirit into the middle of the conversation, pray. Um, oh, I put here in quotes, I'm scared, you know, and that's, that's, that can be your prayer. Just be real, right? This is what we do as men. We're real. Here's your prayer. Oh, crap, Lord. I, and you can say crap to Lord. He's fine with it. Oh, crap, Lord. I'm scared. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. What do I do? Um, I, I, I'm, this is a test. Okay. And the Holy Spirit's going to give you that smirk. Like, got you. Okay. That's what happens. He says, I got you now. Now just, okay. And you're still going to be like, okay, well, I'm getting, I'm still not getting anything. I'm still not getting pray. And then when it's your turn, what's going to happen is you may stumble. You may, you may fumble over your words, but do it gently and graciously and calmly to them and just saying, I'm a different man because I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And then if you're so bold, and some of you are, are a little more bolder than the others, you can say, you know why? Because Jesus Christ hung on the cross naked for me and died for me and was spit on for me, and I'm giving my life to him. I'm, I'm behind him because he, he died and he rose again. And that's another one of those things. Here's the thing. If Jesus never rose again, then it's a deal breaker, right? Because everyone's died. Not everyone, but you know what I mean. Most 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 people, a lot of people have died. Okay, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died and rose again. That is a deal breaker. That is like okay, I'm with him. I'm with him because this book is real, and this is when the mockery and the ridiculing and all this stuff may start happening. And again, it's why you need to know this book. So number one, everyone testifies. Number two, be ready for opportunity to share. Be ready for the opportunity to share, okay? And then I guess I've already tackled this because I said, hey, guys, be ready. Be strategic. Be Position yourselves so that you can be used by God. Position yourself so you can be used by God. So are you ready for the opportunity? Are you ready? Some of you are like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not there yet. I, I, don't, I don't have it in me yet. I'm not. I'm just not there yet. I, Bobby, you, you spill all this out so quickly and easily but I can't do what you're doing. I, I don't have it yet. Okay, we'll pray and, and start doing work. So this is practice. So so do your homework. So start studying. So start start throwing, lobbing these to your close friend or your adult child or your wife and just say, man, this is this is what we talked about today at practice. And man, this is, this is not going to be easy. Okay, be ready for that opportunity. Number three, share what Christ has done. We've already, we've already talked about this. I, I'm, I'm giving my notes, but I'm I'm, I'm now going back over them. Number three, share what Christ has done. We, we've already talked about this. Have some balls and take that step of faith out and say, this is what Christ has done for me. That's why I'm having one beer. That's why I'm trying to change my speech. That's why I, I'm not showing people my tall finger in traffic. That's why, that's why, that's why. It's because I want to share what Christ has done for me. We always got to talk about the enemy, right? Because we, we have that pull. We have that good versus evil. We have that going on. Satan is very good at what he does. We have to give him credit. I don't want to give him credit, okay? But he is good at what he does. You have to be ready for his attack, and he is, does not want you to share what God has done in your life. So he will. you got to be ready for the obstacles, man. you got to be ready for someone to just say, yeah, whatever, whatever, that Jesus crap is all crap. You've got to be ready for Satan to suppress and discourage you. You have to be ready for it. Well, I don't know what to say. Bobby, you can explain it better. I wish you were with me at these parties. Well, I'm going to go to those parties with him. <laughs> Others can explain it better. Uh, why, why should I make a fool out of myself? Because I don't know. I, I'm barely into this Jesus thing. I don't even know where to start. Oh, this is where I put on my, on my notes. Jesus hung on the cross for you. He was spit on 
He was slapped. He was beaten. He was naked for you and for me. He was humiliated. He has changed your life. We must be willing to share our life and how he's changed our life. All right, let's keep going. Number four, have a Christ-like attitude and behavior. Have a Christ-like attitude and behavior. Verse 16 just totally spells it, spells it out. Okay. Um, do it gentle. Have reverence. Don't argue. There's not been one person argued into heaven. Man. There hasn't been one person argued into heaven. You know how they've been gotten into heaven? That's the word God. You know how they got into heaven? It's through love and grace and gentleness. And just like, man, I love you. But if you don't repent and give your life to Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. That's what the book says. It's not what I'm just the messenger, but the book says if you don't surrender and give your life to Jesus and live for him, you will die and go to hell. That's what the Bible says. There's there's two places to go, heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. There's there's heaven or hell. Have a Christ-like manner. Do it with love. Do it with gentleness. Don't be argumentative, men. The gospel is centered around our unworthiness and God's gracious and mercy. Okay, it's centered around how we are inept. We we fall short. Okay, but a savior came and and died for us. And because of his grace and mercy, uh, we will be with him in eternity. So, men, these four things, man, I, I couldn't do these four things uh, years ago. And when I say years ago, 2008, Jeff, you and I are working with each other. I wasn't doing good. When Jeff and I met in 2008, 2009, I wasn't leading the men's group. I wasn't doing any of this. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I just wanted to keep it to myself because I didn't. Well, I, I did have some knowledge. I wasn't vocal about it. And I'm not a Bible thumper at work. And I don't expect you to be either. You shouldn't be. But you should be gentle and, and, and share. But guys, there's one sentence, and this is the end of my notes here. There's one sentence that dictates my life because of my life change in 2008. Now, I accepted Jesus as a 10-year-old in San Jose, California with my mom. So I, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior as 10. But I didn't start living for Jesus Christ until 2008 or nine. And now everything that encompasses Bobby Bandera uh, is my heart is fully alive because of Jesus Christ. I prioritize my day and my life because of Jesus Christ. Everything I do, I try my best. I train, right, is because of Jesus Christ, because of the, the, the crazy change he has done in my heart and in my life. And that's what I want for you, okay? I just want this, this peace that I have that James talked about earlier, the peace that only God can give. He's given me so much peace to now I, I'm bold. I'm, I'm, I'm much more bold. Someone says, so why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Do that. I'm just like, well, I'm just, that goes against what I believe. Like what you're talking about and what you're partaking in, that goes against every fiber that's in me now. Because every fiber that's in me, most I can't say every, but because I'm still a sinful man. But the direction I'm going is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And the world is going against the grain like a, a piece of wood. It's going against that. And so, men, you need to pr pr prioritize your life and your day around him. The banner over my life. There was an old song. I know Russ remembers this. The banner over me is love. The banner. I remember singing that as a little boy. I'm like, that, that song makes no sense. I don't even know what a banner is. They didn't explain what a banner was. But I remember singing the song, His Banner Over Me Is Love. And, and so obviously, when I turned nine, I understood what a banner was. But uh, So the banner over me is Jesus Christ now. And the banner over us men needs to be Jesus Christ. So is the banner over you Jesus Christ? So men... The, the one sentence that I, uh, I put in your notes here, which is great, I love it, by St. Francis, and we'll end on this, and you can go to your tables, or we're going to go into small groups. It says, guys, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Think about that. Think about what St. Francis says. Preach the gospel. Guys, live it. Live it out. Be, the, be, be Jesus Jr. Live for him. And if you have to talk about it, then do it. But our life must be an example. Jeff. I heard once that along these lines, 
a pastor told me once, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by sharing your faith with an unbeliever. Jeff Boyer said, a pastor told him, when you give your life to Christ, you have nothing to lose but everything to gain. Nothing to lose, everything to gain. But what happens in that statement right there is our flesh rears its head and our flesh says, yeah, but I'm not there yet or I can't do it. And, and so it's like we, we have good, good sayings like that. But then that tug comes of I'm not good enough. I don't know yet. So let me pray. Yes. What time is it? Okay, good. The reason that we practice is so that we can stay ready so we don't have to get ready. If you have to get ready at the moment of the party, it's really late. Great, great, you great. Have to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. That's He's saying that when, we, when, we, when we're ready, you're not going to get ready in the moment at the party. You're not going to get ready when you and your wife are going at it. That you, there's no getting ready there. That the game is on. You, you don't practice in the middle of a game. You don't call time out and say, let me do a couple layups, everybody. Everyone just stay there for a second. I need to do a couple layups. Let me take a couple jump shots. I know we're in the middle of the third quarter, everybody, but just let me take a couple of jumpers real quick. We can't, and I'm in construction, and I've used this analogy before. When people are pouring a foundation, Jim, you'll love this. When people are pouring a foundation at a, at a construction site, the first drop of rain that happens, people, they want out because they're like, it's going to rain. You can't pour a foundation when it's raining cats and dogs, right? When, when it starts to rain, you don't pour a foundation. And some of you, it's raining, and it's it's thundering, and it's hail, and you're trying to pour a foundation, and that cement's all sloppy, and you're trying to form it, and you got a smile, and you're trying to form it, and middle fingers are going up, and people are like, "What are you doing? You're trying to form a foundation in the middle of the game when when it's when when you can come up for air, man. When it when it's a little bit calm, whatever that looks like in your life, that's when you pour your foundation. And I see guys right now. All you guys, you're pouring the foundation right now. You're pouring the foundation. Let me pray. Um, we do need to um, put the chairs and tables back as how we got them. I know a lot of you guys came late, but um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to end it now. And you guys uh, get in small groups the best you can. I know it's we're a little discombobulated. But tackle these questions. Pray for each other, close in prayer at 8.30 or at 8.45 or whatever, however long you need. But tackle these questions. Guys on Zoom, love you. Break down these questions. Um, we are not here next Saturday. So get together with guys. Go to breakfast. Do something. And then we're back here on the 12th. And we'll be back in the room on the 12th. We good? Good. Love, love you guys, man. Let's keep going. Let's pray. Father, you spoke through me like you do every Saturday when I... I'm concerned of how my, my, my notes look and am I going to be clear, Lord? And it's like you giggle. And it's like, Bobby, this is not about you. It's about, and I know that, Lord, and you spoke to me. And, Lord, the words that you gave the men today, may, may they penetrate their, their, their soul, their heart. May it marinate in their mind of how they need to take a stand for you because of what you did for us at Calvary. And, and how while we weren't alive yet, you, you thought of us. Why? Because you're God and you can do that. You thought of every man here while you were dying on the cross because you could do that. And Lord, may these men be bold. May they do it uh, gently. May they do it respectfully to their, to their friends and families, their coworkers. That Lord, these men may tip, dip their toe into the water of, of telling people about you. Because Lord, that what Peter wrote is a command. Lord, it's not a suggestion. And so may these men take this command and do it. May they, may they take it in and live it out. We need you, Lord. Help us. Help these men who are going to be tested as soon as we leave the forum. Help these men as they're going to be tested this weekend and here on out. Help them. We know you will because your, your Bible, the, the Bible says you will help us. May these men know that the helper is going to come. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen.